Hello, I'm James Soto here, and I'm here with my great associate and fellow working board member, Kathy Nelson with Pinnacle Financial Partners. We are here because we're really passionate about our maker and manufacturing community. We're here focused with Nashville Made, and, and we're super excited to continue our series called Look Who's Nashville Made. Our job is really to promote the heck out of our makers and manufacturers and all the great business service companies to really help them grow as leaders, as businesses, and really just make this a better place for making things. So we have wonderful folks here today. We have our good friend Chip Higgins with Physix, and we're going to focus on Chip and his business here. So Chip, welcome to Look Who's Nashville Made. Oh, thank you. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Great. Well, we're really pleased to have you. And uh, Kathy's been uh, instrumental uh, in, in getting you here. Um, I think you guys have some history together, right? Like uh, you've been in, in, in similar, if not the same business, right? So, yeah. so tell me a little bit about how you met Chip. Well, let's see. Um, I met Chip when Avenue Bank merged with Pinnacle. And I was fortunate enough to get involved with him as far as trying to support local businesses and with Nashville Made when we were starting that organization up. And Chip led our small business effort at Pinnacle, which you know, in his time there, as with several other banks that he was with, we received, you know, raving reviews and Greenwich studies, which is kind of the, um, the end all be all of banks. If you get to score high on those about how clients view you um, and chip in the small business arena, he tied, I believe, for the amount of awards that Pinnacle received of an all-time record in the time that he was there. So it's he, he's just always been a big supporter of small business and really you know, gets in, can understand and take things from different angles, which I think people appreciate because sometimes you just need somebody to get you out of you know, the norm that you're thinking. And I think he has some great information to share with us today that can start people with that. Wow, that's a, that's a great testament. And so Chip is here to really so, so, if, so if you're if you're listening, if you're watching this. Um, look who's national made episode. If you're a small business owner, you know if it's just if you're just one person and you are making one or more things in Nashville, you are absolutely eligible to be part of Nashville Made. If you are a manufacturer, if you're a small business, if you're emerging mid-sized market business, and um, you know this is an episode for you because one of the things I think I figured out as a small business owner focused on the marketing of manufacturing is other folks have figured some of this stuff out and especially people who have had a vision or if you're a leader or if you've started a venture you know there's folks who've been through some of the same things you have been and, they, and some who work through it through great counsel through great methodologies and some good consult so so really you're not in it alone chip is all about really helping businesses especially small businesses and one of the things that really struck me is that you know he, he said that um, you know, like small business is not inconsequential. You know, if you really look at anything physics says, it's really about helping small business because small business matters. And so um, one of the things we want you to understand before we kind of get in with you, Chip, here is, and everybody, is the context of who Nashville Made is because this is also part of what, how community works. And Nashville Made is a public, private, social enterprise. Um, we are fiscally sponsored by the National Arts and Business Council of Greater Nashville and great partners like Pinnacle Financial Partners, LBMC, Frost Brown Todd, the University of Tennessee Center for Industrial Services and Industrial Strength Marketing. And why we're supporting this is because we really believe in Nashville and, and but, but there was a problem, right? You have an organization because there's ultimately a problem, you have a product or, a, you know, or some type of solution and, and really the problem that we found in Nashville is that Nashville's makers and manufacturers need information, access to capital and guidance. And, and Chip is like prescribed for this type of conversation. And so, so when you look at a problem and you, and you look for folks that are really solving it and you find gaps, we found enough gaps that said, wow, an organization like Nashville Made really needs to exist. And, and so what is the purpose? Like, why do we get up every day? And really very simply, if you make one or more products and you employ one or more people, even if that is you, you can be part of Nashville Made. If, if you are a larger manufacturer, absolutely. And, and we want to just in so many ways make way for makers and manufacturers in Nashville. 
you know, there's, we need space to make things. We need, you know, larger space to manufacture things at scale. And, and if we're going to be a community that makes things, we really need to come together as a community. And so that's fiscally, that's space, that's community, that's educational resources, it's financing. There's so many threads that we can help you in your journey. And so what that really looks at in terms of our focus areas is that what we do is we convene and advocate and obviously COVID has affected our ability to be there with you. We will hope to be together face-to-face -to -face soon and, and, and advocate, obviously. We promote the heck out of Nashville made goods. So if you make a product, come to us. We promote the heck out of it across all the Nashville made channels. And our goal is to, for any type of investment of your time and resources or membership, um, we want to give you a 10X in return on your investment. And, and that's all about connecting folks. And, and today's theme, we're gonna really talk about really that guidance and business assistance, which is a big part of what we do. But we also know that you know, times are gonna ebb and flow and we need skilled labor, we need welders, we need fabricators, we need people who understand the business decision you know, uh, sciences, all those things in the workforce, whether you're trying to get a job or find resources, that's a big part of what we need as makers and manufacturers. So with, with, with uh, the long intro aside, again, please help me welcoming Chip Higgins, founder of Business, Physics. Um, I want you to just get us started, Chip, by telling us a little bit about your journey, your heart, your spirit, and the passion that led to the business and who you focus on. Yeah. Well, again, thank you for having me. I've just been so fired up to be here. And um, I guess my story, and you know, I'll kind of say, you know, back to what Kathy said earlier, I think officially we knew each other beginning at the Avenue merger, but um, you know, banking is such a close fraternity, sorority, whatever, you know, whatever social club that you want. I feel like I've known Kathy for years, you know, before we ever met at Avenue <laughs> and the Avenue merger, we all kind of seem to know each other in the banking industry. So, uh, that kind of dovetails, I guess, to my background. I, you know, when I, believe it or not, even when I was in high school, I, I, I wanted to be in the banking industry. And I know that sounds pretty boring to a lot of people, but there, were, there was something about it that attracted me to it. And so um, in 1984, I moved to Nashville to start in the training program at the old First American National Bank, which is now Regions, uh, after becoming AmSouth. And most banks do change their name two or three times, I guess, over, you know, uh, some time period. Um, but I started there and uh, was in the banking industry for 35 years. And uh, really that entire 35 years I spent uh, working with small business owners. And it started as a lending officer, relationship manager, and then a team leader. And then uh, I led the small business practice for three different regional banks, First American, First Tennessee, and Pinnacle. And uh, it was more programmatic at that level, uh, all the client experience things that we were trying to deliver to, to small business owners. And, um, you know, there are a couple of things that I think uh, drove me to start Visix. Um, obviously, I'd seen a lot of things over the years, you know, three, three decades plus uh, of people doing well and people not doing well and uh, still felt very impassioned about small business owners. Uh, but I also noticed that uh, a lot of their needs were not being met. Uh, I, I came to the conclusion that most of the capital needs of small business owners are met pretty well through banking. Uh, there are a lot of fintech channels developing that seem like they're being met even, you know, more widely than before with all the online lending. Uh, but as we started talking to them during the last part of my time at Pinnacle, I just noticed that um, particularly in the small business market, there were impediments to their growth that were more systemic in the business. You know, there were, there were key things missing in the business that were holding them back from scaling up to the next level. And even if it was their first big scaling event from, you know, going from one person to two or three or four people, uh, it seemed to be a jumbled up uh, mess of a, a lot of different tasks that needed to be done. And uh, in the heat of the battle and running a business, you know, it seems hard sometimes to pull back and deal with the, the one thing that's going to get you there. So um, I thought about it for a while and finally decided, hey, you know, this is a this is an open space in the market that's not being met. Because when I when I talk to these business owners about, well, where are you going to get help? Uh, they're either going online and trying to figure it out, or they would go get, a, you know, uh, explore a coaching relationship. And the coaching relationships that were available at that time were um, pretty significant in terms of a commitment. You know, most coaches would want a six-month commitment or a one-year commitment, and they were very expensive. You know, they were probably anywhere from $1,000 to $1,500 a month, which a lot of those businesses just couldn't afford. 
And um, what I noticed was that um, to get through the problems that they had to get to the next level, I just couldn't imagine that it would take a year to do that. Uh, a lot of them were very microscopic issues within a lane, you know, whether that was uh, where their business was headed and, you know, what they wanted for their business in the next three to five years or how they were dealing with clients or what, you know, hiring people in the workplace environment. But the businesses weren't large enough to need a total recall of everything that they were doing, but they needed to make some critical decisions and had a hard time finding good resources that they could trust and also a thinking partner and a coach and an accountability partner to guide them through the gate so that they could, uh, they could take action and kind of get past it and you know, go through those plateaus that every, every business goes through. So um, I guess it was May of last year, I left the banking industry and dedicated myself to doing this. Um, and we, you know, we basically uh, coach business owners to higher levels of growth and profitability. And the other thing that's really important to me is financial security. And that's not just for the bit, you know, the business and their foundations. But um, one of the things that used to concern me and I, I guess frustrate me a little bit is that small business owners would get way into the game. Uh, they would own a business for 20 or 30 years and decide it was time to exit. And they had never really thought about their business as a financial asset, uh, as an as a asset in, you know, independent of their involvement in it. And you know, what would it be worth in the open market? And uh, one of the things that we try to do at Bizix is make people keenly aware of what that target might be down the road that they're working toward that. And it's a huge part of a small business owner's retirement plan is uh, what's my business worth when I decide to get out of it. And by the time they decide to get out, they really don't want to work in it anymore. And uh, you know, a lot, a lot of deals that they put together are like, you know, we want a three year employment contract or you need to take a note back or whatever. And they're usually ready to go. So I think those are, you know, some of the things that we try to, to coach them toward. Yeah. It's, it's quite it's quite the journey um, and it sounds to me that you're really focused on you know walking together with them and yeah. and, and doing it in small steps um, you know one of the things that uh, Kathy and I were talking about I know Kathy has a number of questions um, there's just a lot going on now so like Kathy you know I know you've done some some thinking about um, you know about chip and you know what, what you know what do you, what do you see some of the big questions well, what, one of the things that interested me is the way that Chip approached innovation. And, you know, there, there was a segment that we were talking about at one point that if you're going to be innovative, what are kind of the top three questions that you want to start with? And the reason I, I like these and gravitated towards them was just because it was really forcing the business owner to step back and look because it's so difficult you know everybody talks about being in the business instead of working on the business and and that's just hard because there's things that need to get done and you're usually the one who has to do them so i think this provides somebody maybe with a good aspect to step back so chip can you share a little bit about um kind of the top three things that if people were going to think about innovation in a time like this what, what are those things that they should step back and ask themselves? Yeah, I think they're just challenging questions. You know, I think, I think that's part of coaching is people will get stuck. And, uh, you know, these are extremely difficult times that we're in, but even in the best of times, I think people get stuck on, on taking the next step. So uh, some of the, the questions that we like to ask to give perspective is, um, you know, one, if, uh, if resources weren't a problem, uh, what would I do? If I, if I had everything I needed to do what I want to do, what would I do? And uh, the reason that's a powerful question to me is it kind of eliminates the scarcity mindset that a lot of people have that, you know, we kind of hold ourselves back and think we can't get what we want, uh, everything that we need to get on the journey that we want to go on. And when you take that off the table and go, well, if I had everything I need, what would I do? Uh, it, it's uh, a freeing idea to uh, at least allow you to clarify the idea that you want to pursue. And I don't want to be too cosmic or mystical about it, but you know, my experience has been that once you make a decision to go do something, you're kind of shocked by the resources that come your way, you know? And uh, I think we can take ourselves out of that mindset that, Hey, I, I'll never have enough money. I'll never get the right people. I'll never, you know, all the things that we think we need that we'll never have. When you make the good decision independent of that, it starts, it kind of starts flowing to you. And uh, that's, that's been my experience time and time again. Um, the other, uh, another power question is, if I knew I couldn't fail, what would I do? And I think, uh, you know, by nature, we're fearful. 
people. Uh, you know, I think part of our brain is, you know, there are things that scare us uh, and they really hold us back from making a decision and having that uh, freedom of thinking about all the possibilities we could do because we'll box ourselves in from doing, even considering something because of the fear of doing it. And so uh, when you ask yourself, you know, if I knew I couldn't fail, there was nothing that would ever hold me back, what would I do? Once again, uh, you're kind of crossing a threshold that opens up your thinking and says, well, if I knew I couldn't fail, I'd do this, this, and this. And then, as we all know, uh, most of our fears are unfounded. Uh, you know, one, once you make the decision independent of fear that this is the best path to go on, um, you can start evaluating all the things that you thought you were afraid of, and uh, most of them are not going to happen. You know, even, even financial ruin. Uh, I was listening to a thing at the Entrepreneur Center the other day, and, um, you know, the, the speaker basically said, look, you know, there's always jobs out there. You know, I mean, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't, you shouldn't use financial ruin as like the thing that would hold you back because there's always a way to make a living. You know, don't, don't ever, you know, get, get bought into that. Uh, but one of the things I like to do, and I do this with my kids a lot too, uh, outside of the business environment is um, this idea of remembering the future. And I really like to say, you know, if it were five years from now and you're looking back on this as your most courageous moment, the bravest moment, and you were celebrating the courage that you had to do something, what would that be right now? I mean, what, what is it that's, uh, that, that you, would, you, you think would take a, you know, an unbelievable amount of courage and you were successful doing it? What would you celebrate about how you did it? And I think that gets us past the fear into the positivity of the excitement, you know, and they're kind of in the same place in the brain, but the excitement of doing something new and different uh, and that, you know, we can all slap high fives and do the victory lap afterwards. Let's celebrate it now, you know, just thinking about how it would work. And uh, that, again, it's a, it's a very liberating thought to, uh, to think about being in the future and celebrating something that technically hasn't happened yet, but you can make it up in your brain that that's how it's going to go. Yeah. You know, fear is, um, is powerful, you know, and, um, you know, one of the things I think that you're always trying to balance is like, you're trying to look ahead, right? Like you mentioned and imagine, but we're always kind of looking over our shoulders <laughs> at the same time. And, and, you know, one of the things I think is super powerful is, is you do have to go and also make a decision to be positive and forward looking and optimistic. Um, and it's hard for leaders to do that because we, you know, it's, it's challenging making payroll every two weeks without exception. You can never miss it. Right. Is, is really, is really challenging. You know, one of the things that, um, what you said speaks to me and I think speaks to a lot of other folks is that, you know, if, if you knew you could not fail, what would you do? Life is short, be optimistic. And, you know, what would it look like? And, mm -hmm. and that could be a motivator. You know, one of the things that um, I remember my, my wife telling me in founding a business, this was during the great recession and times were crazy and, you know, things were uncertain and you can get paralyzed by it. You know, my wife said, you know, if we lost this business, and if we lost everything, you know, we just rocked the double wide. <laughs> like, I grew up camping with my parents. Like, I'd love it. But, but it freed, really, and that would be an adventure, too. <laughs> it, it, freed, it freed, and I think it frees business owners. It freed me to think, you know what? It doesn't matter as long as we're together. The rest of this stuff doesn't matter. Let's rock the double wide. I'd love yeah. it. I'd love it. You know, kind of used to pull a camper, but you know, it was more of a recreation. You know, it was, this one moved. So you know, so I, I think, but but these things, what like what you're saying, and those questions are super power questions because it truly changes the mindset and really puts the fact that failure isn't final in context. And and yeah. in the future, like there was it, Abraham Lincoln said, you know, um, how do, how do you predict the future? You make it. You know. Um, right. That's right. <laughs> you know, so, so that's, that's very powerful. <laughs> um, so, you know, anyone listening here to, to this, you know, here in Nashville, um, if you're a small batch maker, if you've seen, you know, your business, you know, we know there's some businesses that are doing really well. For some reason, you're kind of on a winning kind of type of business, you know, and demand for things. Like if you made PPE or something, you know, like you, you, you're probably on the winning side. And, and, but if you're not, you're thinking a lot of these same things and um, uh, we all appreciate it. So, so Kathy, you had another question that I thought was really. Yeah, I did. And, and Chip and I talked a lot in preparing for this. And um, he, I know Chip reads a lot of different books and 
Um, he puts out these newsletters every week and does book summaries and, you know, a lot of valuable things. And one of the books that he brought up to me to talk about was one called Costivation. And the book's main focus, and Chip, if I get this wrong, correct me, but it's focusing on how to be innovative while lowering your costs. And there's a few traits that they talk about in the book of what they call a cost evader that I thought were, you know, good things, again, for small business owners, any business owners to look at, just like the things we just talked about, to make you step back and, and do things. So what, can you talk a little bit about what a cost evader is? Yeah, and if I, if I could, I, I did want to say that at the beginning, just about some of the things that we do with BizX. Uh, those book summaries are really important to me because I feel like business owners um, don't always have the time to read a 300-page book, but uh, there's usually time to read an eight or 10 page summary and glean the best ideas out of the book. And that's one of the things that we try to do in our coaching process is to make sure people have good relevant ideas to work with as they're making big decisions, you know? And so that, you know, that, that works really well for us. And uh, um, again, I mean, I'd be glad to share the story with, you know, anybody that wants, we'll get that to that at the end, but um, we're, we're glad to distribute those summaries to people to, to consider that. But the idea of the Costivation book is that, um, like right now, I think for most people going through PPP and just kind of evaluating uh, where business is and how much uh, revenue that they have, you know, the, the traditional mindset is I've got to cut expenses, you know, and you're, you're just thinking financially about how can I, how can I cut expenses? And what these authors uh, bring to the table is that, um, you know, when, when you marry a client connection or an intimacy with your clients that can inform you, uh, it's not only about the financial part of cutting expenses, it's about the innovation that leads to different business models that are inherently much cheaper than what you're doing. You know, so uh, it, it can't happen without a level of client intimacy where you understand their behaviors and what they're doing in their business, what they really need from you. Uh, there's probably, you know, there are probably some things that you're doing that are really expensive for you to do that are not mission critical for your core, your core client. And only through that process where you're uh, engaged with your clients, but you're also thinking uh, about how you deliver on things and what's on the table and how things can change that you can produce a very different business model. And I think, you know, without getting real specific, I, I think we all know people around town right now that we've had a different experience with, but we're just as happy. And it was a, it was a different delivery model, but we still got our product and we're really happy with it. You know, we, we don't sit in the cafe, but we still love the coffee. You know, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of things like that going on. So no, um, there, there are three main things that they address, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to give an example of each. I, you know, this is in the summary, but just, just as kind of the flavor of how it would work. You know, one would be using breakthrough perspectives. And I think that is um, widening the lens that you've been looking at your customers with to uh, understand in a different way what it is that they really want, uh, what all the trends are in the market, and really think about, you know, if I were, if I were doing this today for the first time, would I do it the same way? And, uh, you know, the reality is for people who have been at it for a while, maybe not if you've been at it a year, but, you know, if you've been doing something for five or 10 years, you know, there's, there's probably something different that you could be doing. So, um, you know, on the, using the breakthrough perspectives, one of the uh, examples they give in the book is Planet Fitness. And, uh, you know, that was a situation where there was a gym owner who looked at all the different things that they were offering in the gym. And we all know what a kind of runaway train gyms were for a while. It's just like, you know, we went from exercise bikes to saunas and personal trainers and health trainers. And like, you know, there's a million things that you can do in a health club. And, um, you know, that individual basically said, look, you know, for most of the people here, uh, they cancel their memberships, they're too expensive, uh, they don't use all the services. And when, it, when you get down to it, you know, what they really want is reliable exercise bike, treadmill, you know, there were like five things that they needed. He can bring that in at $10 a month, you know, so um, that's kind of a, you know, a reevaluation of uh, something you're doing that had gotten super complicated. Uh, there was a lot more than most of the people needed. And that's not to say that there isn't a, a high end that might uh, value that, but for most of the population, you know, it can bring it in a much lower cost structure and price point for everybody. So that breakthrough perspectives is really important. And, um, the second would be the ability to zoom in on parts of your business that are mission critical. You know, when you think about what you're trying to do for the client and you're thinking about the cost structure, you get really intense about, um, well, what, you know, what are the big cost drivers in my business and how could I do it differently? And it could be any number of things, you know, anywhere in the supply chain, you could pick it apart from inventory management to, you know, all kinds of different things. But, 
I think the one that would stand out that the example they gave is uh, Benny Hanna restaurants and that owner uh, just got to the point where he felt like, you know, I, I can't deal with these expensive kitchen propositions. You know, it costs a lot to run a kitchen. It's eating up all the space in my restaurant where I could be seating people. And so basically, you know, the innovation that came out of it was to move the restaurant right out in front of the customer. And, uh, you know, they're basically preparing food uh, right in front of your face at that restaurant. And uh, that was a, you know, it was a huge breakthrough. But what it came from was like, there's one thing in my craw that I'm trying to, <laughs> that I really want to understand. And what are all the different options that I could do that? And I'm sure there were, you know, probably five or 10 different things that that got thought about before he decided, look, I'm going for it. I'm just going to bring, bring my, my people out here and cook right in front of your face. So um, that, that ability to zoom in. And then, you know, the final is, this is what I've seen so much in this pandemic environment is a willingness to blur boundaries of what, what I do as the business owner and what my client does or what I do as the owner and what my suppliers do. And that there, there are places where people are perfectly happy to do part of the work uh, so that you can do less. And, you know, that's not the only example, but um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty fuddy duddy with technology. I mean, I'm not really up to date. And um, I hadn't been to a Starbucks in forever. You know, I, I went to meet someone there a couple of weeks ago. And I walked in and, you know, I placed my order at the, at the window. I went down, I'm standing there waiting for, waiting for my coffee to come out and I'm waiting and wait, there's like nobody in there. You know, it's like, there's nobody there, but these people keep coming in and picking stuff up. That's not mine. And I was getting like really frustrated about it. And, you know, I got home and I was talking to my daughter who's 20 about it. And she's like, dad, you need the app. You know, yeah, I can't believe you don't have the app, you know? And, and so, uh, you know, that's just an example of, you know, when you think about blurring boundaries, um, people are perfectly willing to order on their own. And you think about the expense of a human being standing there at the register and taking your order. And you know, there's probably like six components of your perfect drink at Starbucks that you're going to order every single time. But someone keeps taking that in time and time again as you go there. And that inherently lowers your cost structure as well. So um, I think there's, you know, there's all forms of collaboration like that, that, um, the critical part, and again, this kind of goes back to the physics model, is one of the things we talk a lot about is client connection. And it's not because we want five stars on Google. Uh, the reason you connect with clients and you're not just interacting with them or, you know, you, you contact them every once in a while, you want the feedback so you can understand all these things so you can make these pivots in your business. I mean, that's where it all comes from is you want your clients to be wowed and, and happy, but you'll learn from them better ways of doing what it is that you've been doing for a long time. And you just come out of the conversation. Yeah. I, I think, you know, a couple you hit some really interesting points there. You know, I think, you know, in reimagining your products and services, it really starts with empathy and really centering on the customer, you know, and essentially opportunities to deliver value. If you're listening, you know, could present themselves and, and, you know, that's, that can be taken to the business that also had to turn into a corner market versus a restaurant and right. similar thinking and similar perspective, you know, and then as you're really centering in on your delighting your clients, you know, one of the things that people also need to understand is that, you know, 60 to 70% of new business typically, you know, even if it's a manufactured product, right? Manufactured to order uh, services companies, especially 60, 70% of your business should come from your existing customers in terms of new business in any given year. And it costs five to seven times more, you know, to acquire a new customer than it than it costs to actually generate more revenue. So, so now, in 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 you know, in light of COVID and reconnecting with what's most important to your customers, you really have an opportunity to organically grow. Right. You know, yep. what we did is we literally called every single one of not only our day to day, you know, collaborators or day to day contacts, but we literally called leader to leader. How's your business? What's right. So we need to recalibrate what we're doing. And, and I think these things that you're saying are so important because when you look at this time we're in, you know, and I think it was put really well, it says, you know, we had the great recession. This is truly the great acceleration. It's accelerating market forces that were already in place, you know, whether it's your Starbucks app or whether it's, you know, a touchless economy. Or, you know, whether it's us Zooming now and the mass adoption and acceleration of Zoom, there's just no going back to, you know, in terms of how we're going to remotely work. Um, you know, the head of motion industries was with me on the show and, you know, basically said we had 70,000 people go remote overnight. Never thought we could have done it. And he goes, we're doing great. Yeah. 
Okay. How about, you know, a, another one that, <laughs> that I, I, yeah. Yeah, my daughter was working at um, uh, Brightside Bakery this summer, and you know, I'll kind of throw this out for them as a plug, but, you know, they, they went to all online ordering, and, uh, you know, you go by and pick your order up. Well, that was beautiful for us. I mean, they were never out of what we wanted. You know, they, they knew in advance that, you know, we, we were coming on Saturday morning and we wanted the mocha, you know, or, or whatever. I mean, uh, that's a beautiful thing for me to know. I, I don't have to worry that they're sold out, you know. Uh, so, you know, those kinds of innovations, I think they're just great for the client, you know. In a matter of weeks and months, there's been, uh, there was a stat, there's been more progress in e-commerce in a matter of eight weeks than in the last five years. I believe and that. Talk about acceleration. And, and I think there's an opportunity and, and it's challenging, it's scary. And I think to your first point, you know, if I had all the resources if I need, what can I do? Or, you know, yeah. I know I didn't fail by going to e-commerce. And, you know, uh, our first episode of Look Who's Nashville Made, you know, uh, we were talking to Katie Vance with Porter Flea. And it's one of the most respected, you know, craft markets. Uh, it's like an institutional, you know, like icon of where you go to really see product season twice a year. And they, we literally, our first episode, we were pitching them pivoting to order in place. And, and exactly that's what's happening. So, you know, if you're listening to this as, you know, from the national made maker manufacturer community, folks are doing this. These are conversations you need to connect with our community members to have. And what's great about, you know, what Chip's doing here with physics is other folks have figured it out. You can give you good frameworks. You can get you, at, you know, get you asking really good questions. And really also give you an idea to say, you know what, you know, maybe I can shift my percep perception. So one of the things that happens in a recession is you can either take that, you know, that conservative protectionist approach, or you can be more progressive and look for the opportunities. And those companies are outperforming the companies that really, really just really protect and preserve and cut their way through. You know, so this is absolutely an opportunity. It's tough for us to do. And, and I think we're getting all the great marks there, Chip. As yeah, and I, you know, the, the other thing, I just want to encourage people to engage with their clients in a different way. You know, I, I think that we have casual conversations with people and we get the Google reviews and everything. But, you know, I, I feel like most customers, if you call five clients together and said, here's three things I'm worried about. I'd just love to know what you think about this. Uh, you'd be amazed at how quickly they jump on it. I mean, they'd be all over it. I mean, they want you to do well. They want they want you to survive and uh, do things in a different Why way. Why am I not doing that? Like, it's uh, actually so easy. People are so <laughs> reluctant. I don't, I don't know. You know, I've never understood, like, if they think it's proprietary and they're going to go tell somebody else or whatever, but uh, you just can't replace that feedback. Uh, you really can't. Yeah. Some of the best marketing is giving up your secret sauce. Right. Because, honestly, it's not as secret as you think. Right. <laughs> but it's but if it's truly valuable, it's appreciated, and you probably have a better chance of really closing out a business opportunity as a result. So, so Kathy, yes, talk a little bit about A and B. What's your C question? <laughs> well, the, again, I the reason I I like these is because it has people. You really step back and take down all the boundaries and just say, okay. I'm going to throw it all up and, and what could I do? And I think that's, you know, as you talked about, very freeing for people and you have to, it makes you step back and you won't have the fear that you had before. But, you know, there's so many things and I know, you know, Chip doing his book summaries and everything and has just met so many people throughout his career that, you know, he, he takes examples from and things. But going forward, how can people, um, get in touch with you and what are some of the other strategies and ways they could take advantage of your expertise? Yeah. Um, you know, we have a website, uh, physics.com. So, um, please come to the website. Uh, we do, we do have a weekly, uh, blog and email. So typically what I'll do is blog on a topic and, uh, it'll be a theme for the week, you know, and there's usually a book summary associated with it, an article or a planning template, something that'll get you thinking about your business. So, uh, when you get that email every week, uh, I do remind people that, you know, we'll, we'll do with you know, a free 30 minute consultation with anybody just to kind of check in and see what's going on in, in your business and uh, how can we help you? Because, you know, a lot of times just curating information for people gets them so far without even getting into a coaching relationship. I and mean, we, we love finding resources for people and, and, and directing in that. So 
uh, please sign up for the email. Um, just reach out to us. Uh, we're on uh, Facebook as Bizix. We're on Instagram as Bizix Ideas. So uh, please follow us on that. Uh, and, you know, as far as the coaching goes, uh, you know, the thing that I'll just uh, bring home is that we're not in long-term contracts. I think that's what's distinctive about business and the coaching industry is that we have a modular approach based on different functions in the business. We have uh, five different coaching lanes and we have a package that includes uh, not only the information uh, to help guide you in your decision, uh, but four coaching sessions, uh, which is usually, you know, about two months of work on your part. Uh, and our whole goal is not, you know, I, this is how I, I maybe wrap up, um, you know, how I talk about momentum. That's kind of the fundamental theme of our, of our practice is that, you know, you can, you can launch a rocket and you think about all the fuel it takes to launch that rocket. Uh, but you can build just as much momentum by pushing something a hundred times. That's a physical principle. You know, you can do it all at once or you can just keep pushing it. And our, our principle is, uh, you know, you don't need to do 400 pages of work on a business plan to go where you want your business to go. You need to just keep working on it in pieces. And that's what we try to do is just kind of, you know, coach you through the big decisions. And, um, and we have the modular packages. We have individual coaching sessions and um, we follow a process of just prioritization, awareness and uh, action. And it's uh, pretty uh, clean and crisp and, um, you know, we, we love to, we love to engage with any industry and any business and uh, just kind of, help you uh, pick up steam and get where you want to go. That sounds great. And, and this is a great time to have great mentorship. Um, coaching, leadership development, you know, even figuring out how you put your product into the market or price it or, or, or position it, right? You know, bizix.com, B-I-Z-Z-I-C-S, if you're listening, .com, or on Twitter or on Instagram, Bizix Ideas, B-I-Z-Z-I-C-S Ideas. And Chip, I can't tell you how much if you're here as a person, maybe just listening, the lights are off, you're on the treadmill. <laughs> how am I gonna do this? How amazing would it be if you could just say, hey, let me give Chip a call. And I know Chip would love to have a conversation with you, you know, if anything, just to give you oh, that sense of what it's like when there's someone who's just really empathizing with you and trying to figure out, you know, how do you get to where you want to go? What's that mission? What's that vision? And, and really, how do you make it reality? So, so that's absolutely wonderful. Kathy, any other parting words, questions for? for no, I just, I'm so glad that, you know, Chip and I are able to continue to work together and um, again, he's been such a big advocate of small businesses and has a lot of just a wealth of information to share with people. And really, again, his heart is in the right place, you know, wanting to support this segment and seeing the gaps and realizing the challenges that you're all up against. So, you know, I, I really appreciate that. And I think he's got some great stuff to share with people and get them moving forward and staying positive. Well, so thank you. Thank you for having me. I I'm so grateful to be here and be part of this community. Well, we're glad to have you. And one of the things that we just wanted to bring it full circle here. And again, if you live in and around Nashville, greater Nashville, and you make one or more products and you employ one or more people, even if that one person is you, you can be part of the Nashville made community. And if you go to nashvillemade.us, you'll actually see a profile page on physics. Uh, on our, our resources and our, our suppliers list. And these are folks that really wanna help you grow your business. And, and, and as you really think about, you know, figuring out how other people have figured things out, come join us for uh, this Look Who's Nashville Made segment. We're right now just producing and posting and we'll, we'll create a destination for you here very shortly. But um, if you have any interest, come join us. We're gonna have lots of virtual events and we're hoping by October um, fingers crossed we can actually start getting together and really jumping right inside of the four walls of a lot of these amazing places where we make things. So thanks for joining us, Chip. Thanks, Kathy. And thank, thank you, you Nashville Made community. We will see you soon. Come visit us on nationalmade.us.